chapter 1. Somebody read verses 1 to 6 for us in Romans chapter 1. scriptures in the, in the epistles, the New Testament especially, but the epistles deal with the fact that Paul and preachers and pastors and teachers need to be warning people about false teachers. This is a major theme in the New Testament outside of salvation because we're always in danger of listening to someone who sounds close to the real thing, but it's not the real thing. And there is just a lack of discernment because we really are not following Christ with the them, vigor, and vitality that we should. Um, we're going to talk more about this Sunday, but we believe a lot of things we don't do. But I guarantee everything you have a conviction about, you do. Everything you have a conviction against, you don't do. I don't care how thirsty you are, none of you drink out of your... Because you have a conviction. That's nasty. Amen. Yeah, Y'all know what I'm saying, right? Yes, sir. I don't care how thirsty you are. You have a conviction yes, sir. about what should go in there and it's not your tongue and it's not your lips. So where all of a sudden did you get this strength to have that great resistance against that nastiness? But you don't have that same conviction about the nastiness of sin. There are a difference between believing. There are a lot of people who believe the facts about Jesus, but there's no conviction about what they say they believe. So I don't need to go to church on Sunday. I don't need to be disciple. I don't need to recognize the Lord's Day. I don't need to make sure he has first place in everything in my life. I believe that I don't have convictions that determine how I behave or I don't behave. 
Well, that's not the picture, the biblical picture of discipleship. A disciple is one who is following after Christ, who is walking in the footsteps of Christ, who is running the race that Christ ran. And there are people who have done it before us and are doing it better than us. <coughs> so the thought process that our flesh conjures up, that Satan whispers in our ears, is that nobody is really doing it. One, you don't know everybody. Two, you're going to see Sunday, there's a whole great cloud of witnesses who did it in spite of their imperfections. So it has been done. Therefore, it should be being done. Therefore, it can be done. All you can really say is, I don't want to do it. Because it is a sacrifice. It is a commitment of your will, your intellect, and your emotions, the totality of who you are. And many churches aren't teaching the Bible. They talk about the Bible. They talk from the Bible. But people don't learn, leave understanding their Bibles. Fortunately, you're not in a place like that. Amen. In our notes, this means that doing Christ is Jesus' earthly ministry. The disciples had quite, li quite literally to follow Jesus, to follow behind him, and to accept the renunciatory lot of wandering about with him. To follow Jesus meant you had to renounce everything that did not line up with Jesus. Yeah, God, I don't want to talk back to me on that. <clears throat> See, we say we're following Jesus, but if we test the evidence, are we really renouncing everything that doesn't line up with Jesus? Pastor, you mean everything? No, I don't mean everything. Jesus meant everything. <laughs> See, this is not about what I think and what I feel. It's not about what you think and what you feel. What has he said? What did he mean by what he said? And what has he provided for you to pull off what he said? Now, you all help me. What excuse do you have when you could not do what he said, but then he died and rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father, sent back the Holy Spirit to indwell you, gave you his word from Genesis to Revelation, what excuse do you have for not being able to do it? All you can really say is, I don't want to. So are we really making disciples? Are you really committed to being a disciple? Am I really committed to being doesn't mean you don't have questions. Don't mean you don't that you understand it all because you don't. But when God has provided a place called the household of God, the pillar and support of the truth, and you won't even go. When He's provided Genesis and Revelation, so you can understand His story. And you don't spend any time in the book. How do we continue to claim that we're something that the evidence doesn't prove out? And I'm telling you, the church today, in many locales, across American landscape, are just entertainment centers. Yeah, that's right. And if they're not entertainment centers, they're just sinners that smooths people and massages people. But they don't challenge people. They don't call people. And people are not being changed. 
That's not discipleship. My state of conversion, we've talked about this, but I want to highlight this again in, in the book that we're going to highlight this. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit is poured into us. Everybody got that? Yes. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. So you're indwelt with the Spirit. It comes to make its abode. Jesus talks about this in John 15, 16, and 14. That he and the Father would come and make their abode with us. They would come and indwell us. They would come and live in us. In the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the disciples in Acts chapter 1. I must go away that he might come. But everything I have been to you in the incarnation. He will be to you in the indwelling. Amen. And the filling. So we have it better than what they had. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We have it better because we have Jesus in us, not just with us. We have Jesus in us, not just because if he was with us, he'd be living at 333 North 18th Street. Uh, <laughs> Y'all be in trouble. <laughs> but since he is in us, he can be in us all at the same time. Yes. We have it better. But we live less. And, I, and I, I, I blame the modern day church in America. This happened a long time ago in England after the Great Awakening and it's just a vast wasteland of, of secularism. But now that has moved to the American shore. And we're asleep at the wheel because we see what happened to England. But because of our American pride, we don't think it ever happened to us. And they felt the same way before it happened to them. The Whitfields, the 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 the, the uh, reading all these Tyndales, or reading all these biographies, uh, all these guys, Jonathan Edwards, great awakenings, great revivals, great movements of God, and now it's a spiritual wasteland because apostasy set. And what's happening in America that Brother McFadden described to you started there, and you see how that turned out. Great cathedrals and buildings built to God no longer have anything to do with God. Places that used to be mon monuments to the word and the work of God have become mortuary. But we don't think that can happen to us. Now, it wasn't the buildings that became mortuaries, it was the people. The people became dead in faith. The people stopped following Christ and started to follow psychology and secularism and sociology and all the Marxism, all these things he described to you. And now it has come to the American shores, and the church is eating it up. But just like the rats in your house, and the mouses in your house, they don't realize the bait is all designed to kill them. Because we become so attached to this world system. And all that, and we got all these rationales and excuses that are not legitimate for two disciples. They're legitimate for church goers. They're not legitimate for true disciples. Okay, so you guys can ask questions anytime you want. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit is poured out. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit the day you get saved. 
Now, you must constantly be filled with the Spirit, which is where the empowerment comes from. And so you don't need more Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs more of you. And the Holy Spirit will never take control of you if you don't submit yes. and surrender. Yes, sir. It's like your homes. You have electricity flowing through your wall, but if you don't ever plug in, don't ask why it ain't working. Amen. I keep pulling the chain on the light, and it won't come off because you don't have it plugged into the box. And how many of us are like that throughout the week? We're pulling on God's word, we're pulling on God's promise, and the light won't come on. Have you checked to see if you're plugged in? Because there's no power in the lamp to pop. And the power comes from a power plant. Heaven is our power plant. It's got plenty of pop. It's got plenty of juice. And here's the good news. You don't ever get a monthly bill because the bill's already been paid. You just won't plug in, but you pull it, and you and you sh and you shift it, and you you shake it, and you're changing the bulb, and nothing happens, and you won't even look down and see this plug in. Some of us plug in on Sunday and plug out by the time we leave the sanctuary. Don't even remember what we just heard. Listen, you can study the disciples. They didn't forget a lot of what Jesus learned. Listen, y'all didn't, didn't catch that. Jesus says, when the helper comes, he will remind you of everything that I taught you. Now the good news, here's some more good news. You don't ever have to worry about the helper waiting for him to come. So since you have the Holy Spirit abiding and dwelling in you all the time, how are we not remember? If when he comes, he's going to remind you of everything that I taught you, and he's already come, according to Acts chapter 2, how is it we're not remembering? Well, Pastor, you got to understand, we get old. My memory don't work the way it used to. See, that's your problem. You're counting on something fleshly when you should be counting on something spiritual. Because the Holy Spirit, the older he gets, the better he gets. Yeah. See, the older we get, the worse we get. We have memory problems. But the more the Holy Spirit gets you, the better your remembrance gets. And this is one of my cardinal pet peeves that we, and I believe this is why we are where we are in the state of our country, in the state of our churches, especially in our homes, is that we taught people to memorize scripture without a context. Listen, when you rip scripture out of context, you can make it say anything you want to say. And if you're making it say anything you wanted to say, it no longer says what God meant by it. So even though you have scripture, it doesn't have power because it's not in the context and the meaning that God meant for it originally. So we got all these Bible memorization things, and, and we should memorize scripture, don't get me wrong. But you need to memorize it in a context because it means something in a context. You make it mean anything if you rip it out of the context. And it's his story. No human being has the right to edit what he meant by what he said. Amen. God is the only perfect art. He don't need no edits, no rewrites. But we do that. We do that. That's not discipleship. So Ephesians 1, 3-4, Titus 3, 4-8, some of those we've already covered. Our body is this temple, 1 
1 Corinthians 6, 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He does not dwell in buildings made with hands. He dwells in people. So if you wouldn't do it in the building, don't be doing it in your body. That'll make you stop and pause about some things. Because I've been pastoring 27 years now. And there are certain sins I ain't never seen y'all do on Sunday morning. Because there's something about being in the building. That we shouldn't do that or say that or act that way. But you are the temple. We corporately are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So where do we get all this self-control on Sunday morning? Mm -hmm. You know, I've tried to think, 27 years, I don't think I've had to tell somebody to stop cussing on Sunday morning. <laughs> now in counseling sessions, that's a whole different ballgame, but on Sunday morning, <laughs> hey, hey, stop talking to you. Because there's something about making that left hand or right hand turn into the parking lot that made people act differently than when they were on the street on the way to the church. Discipleship is a lifestyle. It's a way of living. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of breathing. It's a way of being. It's a never-ending process. We got people who don't want to come to church. I don't have to go to church to be saved. You are absolutely correct. You do have to go to church to be obedient. You're not for it to say to say, gathering yourself as some have done. People have tried it before. Don't do it. Well, I come to church, Pastor, but then at the benediction, the rest of the day mine. No, it's not. It's the Lord's Day. Yeah, but I've been rushing and hustling and busting and all week, and i got to have some time to myself. To do what? Right. <laughs> when you leave here, what are you going to do? You're going to go home and do something that ain't got nothing to do with Jesus? Ain't got nothing to do with the sermon you just heard? Ain't got nothing to do with serving a fellow brother and sister who can't get out and meet their needs. You're going to go back home to your idols. And you're going to serve them and worship them. And give them the attention because they do something for you that you don't seem to be getting from God. Tell the truth and shame and death. <laughs> we now have a mediator in heaven to respond to our prayers. You got Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father as your high priest mediating on your behalf. Daddy, you ain't never been human. You, 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 you know everything knowledge-wise but you don't know everything by experience. Yeah. But I do. Yeah. I, I know what it is to take on humanity. To be tempted. To be tried. Let, let me tell you what they're experiencing. Aren't you glad you got somebody sitting at the right hand of God to help the Father help them explain those things? Aren't you glad you got somebody sitting in the right hand of God who knows what you meant by your prayer and how off you was and can rearrange your prayers so it comes out and pleases God? Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Do we have Yeah, they asked for this day, but this is what they really need. So not answer that one. This is what they really meant. This is what they should have seen. Jesus does that for us. The Holy Spirit does that work on our behalf. Because we don't know what we really need. 
We got felt needs, we got fleshy needs, we got wants, we got desires that sometimes do not line up with God's will and God's purposes. Everybody here should be able to testify that you are happy God didn't answer some of your prayers. Amen. Because I can take you to people who wish God had not <laughs> allowed some of the things that they asked for. We have angels all around us. Angels are servants of God. They minister on our behalf. You thought it was your driving skills that kept you from running off that road, didn't you? Absolutely not. <laughs> you thought it was your athletic ability that, that caught you when you were stumbling down the stairs about to fall on your head. <laughs> Listen. We have the blessing and benefit of having <laughs> angels who serve on our behalf for God, who protect us from things that we don't even see, who battle in the heavenlies against demonic forces so things don't ever get to us that Satan's trying to get to us. And God can't get you to open your mouth to praise him. To worship him with them, vigor, and vitality, all you can do is mumble. <laughs> and this is why when you read the Gospels and you see the accounts of the disciples, Jesus had to put them in situations to help them understand. Yeah. Do you really understand who I am and what I'm about? Yeah. Yes, he Let me put you in the storm and go to sleep on you. And see if you remember what I told you before we got on the boat. Let us go to the other side. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Why y'all trying to wake me up because of a storm in the middle of the sea? Now my humanity <laughs> identifies with the disciples, right? Because I can't swim. Yes. Boat going down, yep. I got questions. Yes. But faith says... Did you hear what he said? And did you believe what he said? Didn't you not hear him tell you, I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die on the cross? Why do you think he's going to drown in the middle of the sea? Did you hear what he said? Did you believe what he said? And he's constantly teaching them these things. Why? Because when he leaves them, and he leaves them with the commission of going out and making disciples, they're going to need that same kind of understanding and faith and courage to go into all the world and make disciples. But he did not give them a mission without giving them promises and power in his presence. We have that too. We have that too. And we have angels. We are Christ now Christ's workmanship. The word workmanship in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 means in, in the original language means poem. Poems are something you read and you recite. And all poems have a message. Paul would put it this way to the Corinthian church, you are my epistles. I don't need letters to commend me, to validate me. All I need is for people to look at you and read you. And they would know what I'm all about. Now, as your pastor, uh -oh. <laughs> when you out there in the world, as God's poem, uh -huh. as your pastor's epistle, when people read your life, what they come out with, that validate their ministry to you on God's behalf.
It's real. Paul says, I don't need letters of recommendation from men. All I need is, you, you, you're my epistles. You, you, you know what you do, epistles are letters. You know what you do with letters, you read letters. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Where are the good works at? And who did the work? Then how come you don't look like what he worked? Where's the change, the transformation? The change in priorities, the change in purpose, the change in... That looks like you follow in Christ. <laughs> Please hear what Brother McFadden says. There are so many false ideologies out there that are trying to mislead you. Let me say this. Stop turning your kids over to Caesar. And then being upset with the fact that Caesar don't teach the Bible. That's not Caesar's role. Don't let me start on pet peeves. Listen. Deuteronomy 6 and 7 makes it clear that it is the home's responsibility to teach your children what God says they need to know. It is not Caesar's responsibility. Right. Amen. If you want them to know about history from a biblical perspective, Amen. you teach them. Amen. Yes, yes preach it, brother. Why do you expect Satan to tell the truth? <laughs> Who's over this world system? And you upset because they won't Oh, you got belief, but you ain't got no convictions. Because if you had convictions, you would realize Caesar is doing exactly what the head of Caesar's system wants him to do. And you're not changing that. Because God, for a temporary amount of time, is allowing that to be so. The problem is, what are Deuteronomy chapter 6 folk in? When they get up in the morning, when they sit at the table, when they go out the door, when they go along the way, when they come back through the door, when they lay back down at night, where them people at? We upset because Caesar won't teach what we supposed to be teaching. This is just crazy. But see, I'm not surprised if you understand that you are living in the great apostasy. See, I'm not shocked. I'm not asking questions. I, what's going on? See, I'm not Marvin Gaye. What, I know what's going on. <laughs> Marvin Gaye. I know why things are the way they are. Absolutely. Because men have become lovers of, yeah. rather than lovers of, oh, not the world. See, Second Timothy is not to the world. It's an epistle written to a pastor or to a church. Yes, sir. This is what the church is going to be back, be like. You know that. Go to Revelation, and the first church that Jesus talks about is what? The church of Ephesus, the same church that 2 Timothy was written to. Mm -hmm. They never recovered their first love. Mm -hmm. And every church itself for two is a downhill slide after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, the problem in our world is not the government. Mm -hmm. The problem in our world is not the gender. They confuse. They're supposed to be confused. It's God's people who's joining their agenda. That's the problem. Disciples do not join the world's agenda. Church folk will. Church goers will. But not disciples. Because they have total allegiance to one master. And another they will not follow. He quoted, but my sheep know my voice and they will. 
Every sheep knew the voice of its shepherd. All the shepherds could come to the sheepfold and they could whistle or they could call out. Not a sheep that didn't belong to them would follow them. Jesus said, my folk are like that too. Wait a minute, Pastor. What you saying? I ain't saying nothing. This is what Jesus said. <laughs> His sheep won't be listening to the mother's strange voices. So his sheep are not confused about gender issues. His sheep are not confused about the abortion issue. His sheep are not confused about the green and the socialists and all. They're not. Because his voice don't say those things. Amen. Is anybody with me this morning? Yes. Yes. The Spirit prays for us when we are hurting. Thank you, Lord. been too weak to pray. Yes, Lord. You ever been too hurt to pray? Yes. Yes. All you can get out is a groan. But Lord have mercy. You have someone interceding on your behalf. And the good thing when we're weak, he's always strong. Because he's never weak. Listen, I got good news. You can't lose with the stuff God gives us to use. Mm -hmm. The only way you lose is you don't use your stuff. Our spirit is quickened. Let's turn to Romans 8, 15, 17 so we can see what the Bible means by that. Y'all got any questions so far? We're talking about making disciples, right? Yes. I am not interested in making church go. I have no interest in that whatsoever. I have no interest in making children of the devil. I'm all about making disciples. People who follow after Jesus Christ. Okay. What time do the people permission need to be back? I'm sorry. Yeah, meet me now. Well, I think take her too. She needs to get back. I didn't want to hold you guys up. Yeah. Well, let's just stop there. Let me ask you a question, and we'll just stop there and pick up here next Wednesday. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was just going to say, if people go to church and they believe in Jesus, but I don't know. I was. I heard that if they believe in Jesus. So, but, and that's true. That the Bible does say that, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to believe? Okay. In other words, and we're going to talk about this Sunday and Sunday's message in Hebrews, it means to trust him. What does it mean to trust? To believe. To illustrate is... I watched all of you who came into the room after some of you were already here. You pulled out the chair, you sat in it, and you never tested it. How did you know that chair was going to hold you up? Because I could have came in here with a screwdriver and a wrench and loosened all the bolts. Are you putting your full weight? on who Jesus is, what he has said, what he has done, and what he has promised to do. That's what it means to believe. It does not mean you believe the facts. Brother Marcus showed you guys Sunday, the demons know who he is. They believe. They don't follow. So what's the difference between people in the church believing who don't follow and the demons who believe and don't follow? Nothing. But when you commit yourself to him and you follow him, then you know you have belief that has, is followed by conviction, and we will see you live out those convictions based on what you say you believe. Does that make sense?